Hi, Shalom, Chaverim. <clears throat> uh, they tell of a, uh, we'll call him Bob. They tell of a certain Bob who landed the dream job. He was uh, a CPA, and he actually headed a, uh, an entire team working for one of these gigantic uh, five, Fortune 500 companies. What was surprising about Bob, that when he was in school, though of course he was competent, he was not outstanding. And as a personality, he was ordinary. And uh, that job that he landed was in high demand. So once, a close friend asked him, Bob, tell me the truth. How did you get that job? He says, I'll tell you. Um, by word of mouth, we heard that there's an opening. And I and two of my uh, former classmates showed up. We're all dressed, you know, appropriately. Everyone has their their curriculum, and their, not their curriculum, their resume, and uh, we're waiting. And we're told that something unusual will happen. Instead of being vetted by a committee, each one of us will be allowed 10 minutes with the boss himself, and we have 10 minutes to make our case of why we should be chosen to be this, the head of the CPA uh, team. First fellow is very, very talented and very personable, and he came in, and we were pretty sure that we're waiting for nothing because he'll certainly land the job. Ten minutes later, he came, comes out, and he's really upset. And we say, so how did it go? He said, I don't know. He's weird. He's weird. He gave me a bunch of facts and figures, told me to compute them. I did. I'm sure I was right. He looked at them, and he said, out, you don't have the job. And we were both surprised. I mean, this guy never makes a mistake. And he has everything that a uh, Fortune 500 company needs. Well, the second fellow goes in and has a 10-minute audience. He comes out equally frustrated. I say, so how was he? He says, I don't even know if you should go in. The guy is really an eccentric. I started to speak about myself, and he says, let me see you in action. And he gave me some simple figures to compute. I did. I'm sure I made no mistake. He looked at it and he says, out, you don't have the job. Well, I was terrified, but I figure I came so far, why not try it? I walk in, he's sitting behind this gigantic mahogany desk and I uh, present to him my resume. He barely looks at it. He says, I see you're qualified, but frankly, I've interviewed people that had much better qualifications than you. Can you give me one good reason why I should hire you? So I said, uh, sir, I have the, the company, the best interests at heart, and, and I will try my best to make the company grow. And he mutters, everyone's giving me that baloney. Well, let's see you do it. He says, look, you have eight more minutes. I'm going to give you uh, two sheets, outlays, expenditures, income. I want you to compute the figures and tell me, are we going to make it or are we losing he gives me the, the two papers. I glance at them. Figures are not that difficult, but I don't do anything. So he says, hey, Bob, you only have four and a half minutes left. What are you waiting for? He says, sir, you didn't yet tell me how do you want these figures to look? Is it for the IRS? I can make it look low. Is it for the stockholders? I can make it look better. The boss looked, beamed. He says, you got the job. And that's how I got the job. Now, whether or not the story is true, I don't know. But I heard myself from a statistician who told me that they say in, this, in the world of figures, there's truth, there's falsehood, and there are figures. Because figures can be manipulated, they can be interpreted, and they can be understood. So figures don't lie, but how you stack the figures and how you present the figures is really very much dependent on what do you want to prove. So I, this got me thinking. Let me tell you two set of figures, two sets of facts. Okay, I'll make them both extreme because most of us are somewhere in the middle. So the first set of figures is a list of assets. There's a boy called Gaby. He's born in the Hamptons, Long Island. His father is a successful surgeon. 
His mother is very attractive in looks, and she is a real doer for the community. He grows up in a beautiful home. He's given a private education. He's an only child, so he has their undivided attention. And he has two puppies. <laughs> facts, simple facts. Let me tell you now an opposite extreme. Someone is called Solomon, and he's born in the inner, inner city. His father is a drunk. He has three brothers, none of them finished high school. He has a mother who's overwhelmed and comes down on him like a ton of bricks. She's domineering, he don't do his homework. And all of the surrounding parts of this neighborhood is dangerous. Facts, figures. Which of these two will become more successful? Which one of these two will have a more rewarding life? You could guess, not always is the first set of figures going to come out to an asset. Because all of those pluses can be seen as a negative. My father, too busy. My mother, disinterested. I had no siblings to, to play with. All of the people in the private school were rich kids, very arrogant. That I had nothing to work for. It was all given to me. And God forbid, all of those pluses, which so many of us would uh, admire and hope for, turn out to be negatives. And then that set of negative integers, a, 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 a father who's an alcoholic and a family that's falling apart and a, an environment which is unwholesome and a mother who's domineering, they're all positives. Because he knows what he does not want to do. It's very clear to him the choices in life. He also realizes that he has to do it on his own. And he also realizes that his domineering mother is actually his best friend and closest confidant. And this person might have a wholesome, indeed, a happy life. So which one is it? Integers don't lie. Facts do not lie. But how you stack them up, how you add them up, where you want to use and utilize these facts, that will make all of the difference. Judaism is a wonderful religion. In addition to all of the different rituals that were, that were taught and all of the commandments that we're obligated to do, we have attitudes which were encouraged. And in the Hasidic uh, literature, these encouragements are even stronger at times than an injunction. And one of those attitudes is, be happy. Try to find happiness in the ordinary. And as one holy Rebbe said, nowhere in the Bible will you find the words, thou shalt be happy. It's not a commandment. But what happiness could do for a person in terms of elevating him and bringing him closer to God, even the biggest, strongest commandment cannot do. And nowhere will you find a, a shall not. Thou shall not be sad. But what sadness could bring a person, as we all know, into inaction and depression, God forbid. So here we are, and we have an attitude issue. You should be happy, and you say, how can I be happy? I don't have a job. I don't have a spouse. I don't have the latest car. I'm not that well. My children are giving me service. I have no, uh, no children. Everyone has facts and figures. You can't deny them. True, but you could reinterpret them. Whatever you have could be interpreted as these are the building blocks of life itself. God has given you the best for what you need. And if there are challenges and obstacles, it's in order that you may overcome them and you may actually grow from them. So friends, don't look at so much what you have. Look at how to interpret what you have. I bless each and every one of us that we have the best of everything, the best of health and the best of wealth and the best of companionship. But whatever, what, whatever we were blessed with, we have to know it is a blessing. So may God give us the wisdom for us to know how to use these blessings. Shalom.